Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. Greetings, friends. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. We're going to ask the Lord to uh, guide us today and be with us and anoint us and, and bless you on that end. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather with the brethren. Lord, we ask you to reach into their homes and bless them, Lord, to draw them meet their needs in every way, Lord. Lord, I just ask you to give me a little bit of wisdom to share with them today, Lord, that will make their lives a little easier, prepare them better for the days to come, uh, bring provision into their life, you know, your, your healing, your, your deliverance from sin, your, your uh, uh, provision in all ways, Lord. God, give us Give us this um, anointed few minutes, Lord, to uh, touch their souls and bless our brethren, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it. Amen. Amen. Well, I was thinking about sharing with you something about the arm of the Lord. You know, the Bible says, And on mine arm shall they trust. So I thought maybe we could start in Isaiah 51. Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye were hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye were digged. Well, we know what rock we've come from, don't we? If you really are a Christian and abiding in the Word of God and depending upon the Word and putting your faith in the Word, the rock is Jesus, right? And, of course, we, we understand that the purpose of Jesus was to replicate himself in our lives through the word that he sows in our heart. Bring forth that fruit in us. And verse 2 says, Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For when he was but one, I called him, and I blessed him, and I made him many. Well, we know that also for Christians that the Lord Jesus is our rock and that when he was but one um, he gave up his life that, and he uh, like a grain of uh, wheat fell into the earth and died and in order to bring forth much fruit in his image as you know wheat brings forth other wheat in its image right so this application for us can be also um, New Testament right for the Lord hath comforted Zion he hath comforted all her waste places why is he pointing out Zion here because Zion is meant to be that replication that we were talking about the image of the Lord um, the people who have come to the place of the presence of God they live in the presence of God he abides in them they abide in him right that's what the temple and Zion all represented. So he hath comforted all of her waste places. He hath made her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. And obviously, folks, that the wilderness that we're coming to is going to bear much fruit, as the Bible says in so many places. And um, actually, that's where Zion's going to be built. It's because of the, the wilderness puts us in a position where we have to begin to walk as... Um, as uh, believers and as people who the righteous shall live from faith the Bible says God is interested in making people who live by their faith and that's what a wilderness of course does and gladness shall be found therein thanksgiving and the voice of melody God's people are going to have joy in the wilderness because they're going to see the great provision the great care 
of God. They're going to be delivered of their sicknesses and their demonic oppressions and all. They're going to bear the fruit of Jesus Christ. There is going to be joy in tribulation. There is going to be. And he says, Attend unto me, O my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall go forth from me. The Bible also says, by the way, that the law shall go forth from Zion. Several times, as a matter of fact. But then Zion is that, that uh, one made many, you see. And that's what Zion is today, folks. Zion is not... Uh, Old Testament Jerusalem over there that's so totally corrupt with her people. Uh, Paul said in Hebrews 12 that we have come to that new Zion, that new holy city, the city of God, the spirits of just men made perfect. And it is, of course, a spiritual Zion that we've come to. And he says, Attend unto me, O my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall go forth from me, and I will establish my justice for a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the people. Mine arms shall judge the people. Uh, the isles shall wait for me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Now, we know who the arm of the Lord is, don't we? Any of you that's ever read Isaiah once know that that's Jesus, right? The arm of the Lord. To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? But he just also quoted mine arms because, once again, he was talking about the one being the many. The Lord is coming in his people. He is coming to be what he was 2,000 years ago in his people. He's coming to manifest his same power, his same strength, which is what the arm represents, in his people. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. Now, what time is he talking about here? I would say there isn't any other time but the great and terrible day of the Lord that he's talking about here, which we are coming to in these days. So you see, this revelation in chapter 51 is an end-time revelation, among other things. It's an end-time revelation. It's leading up to the very end. He said, But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Then he gives an exhortation in 7 and 8 to his people not to fear men, not to fear the reproach of men or their revilings. And we are coming to a time when the beast is going to make war on the saints and a, a fearful time for those that don't put their trust in the strength of the Lord, which is what he just said. And on mine arm shall they trust. They'll trust in the strength of the Lord. But you notice when he talked about this uh, replicated, um, the one becoming many, he spoke of Zion. Well, here in verse 9, he also speaks of Zion. He says, Awake, awake, and put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old. Well, you remember, in the time of Moses, the great miracles God did to provide for and protect his people. And in the days of Jesus... The same thing, the great provision that God sent uh, to provide for his people and to heal and to deliver and to answer their prayers that had been prayed so many times. You know, well, we're coming to the same time, folks, except on a larger scale, same time. And uh, the arm of the Lord is going to awake as it was in the days of old. And I'm talking about the arm of strength, God's strength. He said, the generations of ancient times, is it not thou that didst cut Rahab in pieces, and thou didst pierce the monster? And it is, not, uh, is it not thou that driest up the sea and the waters of the great deep? Of course, he's talking about the Red Sea there. That was through Moses that time, right? Um, that made us the depths of the sea uh, a way for the redeemed to pass over. Once again, folks, we're about to pass over our Red Sea experience and go into our wilderness. 
And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Very interesting how he's talking about this because we're going through a wilderness to get to Zion, you know. Um, the first fruits are just now coming to Zion, but they're going to bring the multitudes to Zion, kind of like Moses, you know, brought the multitudes um, to uh, face God on his mountain, the mountain of God. And Jesus, who was the first fruits unto God, who was also represented the man child who uh, brought God's people um, to know him, to uh, what Paul called in Hebrews 12, uh, Zion. You, have, you are come unto a city, uh, unto a mountain that, that, that might not be touched. Um, in other words, not a physical mountain. But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, so on and so forth. So, in Paul's day, because God's people did walk in the truth and the revelation and in the power of the gifts and so on and so forth, that's been stolen from the church by false prophets ever since, they came to the true city of God. And um, in our day, of course, God is going to do the exact same thing. He's bringing us back to the city of God. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. It will be such a happy day that we are, have returned to our city of the living God, to live in His presence. All right. Well, let me point out a few more things about this arm of the Lord. It seems to be manifested in a couple of different ways. Number one, Jesus was the arm of the Lord. But we know, we've studied, and some of you, if you haven't been with us for a while, you might want to go back and um, read some of the archives on our site, America's Last Days, uh, the AVR brought, um, archives. But uh, if you haven't been with us, uh, I'm just going to point out to you that um, we've, we've done quite a bit of study in on Zion already what it actually represents, and so on and so forth, and what it is to be coming to it. And, um, and the arm of the Lord was not only manifested through Jesus, but in the text that we're reading through Isaiah, it's also manifested in Zion, because the Lord, the first fruits, is coming to Zion. And, and guess who's in the midst of Zion? And it is the Lord himself. Well, uh, I want you to jump down to uh, 52 and verse 1. It says, Awake, awake, and put on thy strength, O Zion, which is, of course, the arm of the Lord. And that's, what, uh, that's what's happening now, folks. Zion is putting on the strength of the Lord. And put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. I want to point out to you again that the holy city was only called, the last time it was called that is when Jesus died and was resurrected. That's when it was last called the Holy City. And uh, spiritual Jerusalem now is called the Holy City. Okay, You say, well, I saw it in Revelation. No, you need to go back and study our Revelation teaching because you'll see that that was not, that is not physical Jerusalem. It is so corrupt and fallen and full of sin and sinners. We're going to see something about this Zion that he's talking about in Isaiah that it is not that at all. Watch carefully. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments. What is the garment? The garment in the scriptures is our acts, our works. Right? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And the bride in Revelation 19 put on the, the lampros garments, the bright and shining, glowing garments garments, which are the righteous acts of the saints. So, the acts of Zion is her beautiful garment. The fruit that they bear, that they walk in, is their beautiful garments. And of course, you need the strength of the Lord to bring that forth. Uh, we don't want to do our works we cannot do the works of God through our own strength, can we? We have to have the strength of the Lord. His anointing that's going to go forth in these days is going to bring great strength to the people of God to walk in places that they never would have thought possible. The great outpouring of the Spirit is going to empower God's people. For henceforth 
there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Okay now. Now we're, look, we're talking about a Zion here that has nothing to do with physical Zion. There are many unclean in physical Zion. Many, many spiritually uncircumcised because we're obviously circumcised in, in heart now, not in flesh. That's what Paul said if you're a New Testament Jew, right? Spiritual New Testament Jews grafted into the olive tree called Israel, right? But this Zion... There is no unclean or uncircumcised. That is, those who don't have the flesh cut off, basically speaking. Right? So he says, Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit on thy throne, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bonds of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. I'm going to jump down to verse 8 here. It says, The voice of thy watchman, they lift up the voice. Together do they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord returneth to Zion. Wow. Look at that. Agreement among the leadership? Yeah. All over the world, too. All over the world. This Zion is going to be in total agreement when the Lord returns to Zion. Now, we know from Hosea 6, 1, 2, and 3, that he's coming at the time of the latter rain, on the morning of the third day. He's coming as the latter rain. He shall come unto us as the latter rain. He is returning to Zion, but it's not physical Zion that he is returning to at this time. It is spiritual Zion. He is coming to be manifested in his people as he promised. And um, when he does... The leadership of this spiritual Zion, the David ministry that's being raised up in our day, because God said that David would never want for a son to sit upon his throne. And in fact, it says sons. So in this day, there will be many David rulers of Zion, in whom the Lord Jesus himself lives, because as you know, Jesus is David, and he is the ruler of Zion. And he's the ruler of our Zion. Our capital city uh, should be ruling over all of Christianity, but they're in rebellion. Okay. So when the Lord returns to Zion, that is the Zion that's going to be once again raised up in our day. You know, God's people have been taken captive to Babylon. And the first fruits are just like in history. They are returning out of Babylon to rebuild Zion. Okay. So when the Lord returns to Zion, all of his watchmen are going to see eye to eye. That's astounding. That lets you know it is not at all physical Zion, once again. Not at all physical Zion that we're talking about, because that's not possible. Um, they're in rebellion. There are many denominations in physical Zion over there. They're very schismed and at war with one another. So... Um, Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm. Well, there it is again. In the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Listen, that's what is about to be shown to the nations in the very near future. God, the holy arm, which we know as the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to be seen in these people. It's going to be seen in Zion. All the nations are going to see this. Why? Because this time we're not talking about geographic Zion, but Zion earthwide. All over the earth, Zion is going to be manifested in the people who walk in the presence of God and in the people who are a holy people. And they're going to be able to reveal exactly what Jesus revealed in his day. That is the arm of the Lord. His strength is going to be seen. His power is going to be seen in these people. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Cleanse yourselves, ye that bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall 
not go out in haste, neither shall you go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and God of Israel shall be your rearward. Behold, my servant shall deal wisely. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high, like as many were astonished at thee. Hey, who do you think he's talking about there? He's talking about the Lord there, but who is he talking about in verse 13? He's talking about those servants in whom the Lord's arm is being manifested. He's talking about the people of Zion in whom the Lord is living and being manifested. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Just as the Lord said he was going to come as an epiphany before he comes as a perusia, which is a, a shining forth from his people before he comes for his people. We can't get into that study. We've already done that one. Verse 14, like as many were astonished at thee, his visions was so marred more than any man, and his form more than, any, than the sons of men. Talking about Jesus, right? So shall he sprinkle many nations, and kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which he hath, that had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they understand. In Isaiah 53 and verse 1, <clears throat> Who hath believed our message? Now I'm getting to my point here. <laughs> Who hath believed our message? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? You know, the only people that get the revelation of the arm of the Lord is the people that believe His message. That's the only ones, folks. Everybody else walks in their own strength. They haven't been revealed the revelation of the power of God to save, to deliver, so on and so forth. They still walk in their own strength. <clears throat> it reminds you of the, the arm of Jeremiah 17. In verse 5 it says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed is the man that trusts in man, and maketh the flesh his arm whose heart departs from the Lord. In other words, if somebody is not trusting in the strength of the Lord, is trusting in their own strength, in their own ability, their own salvation. <clears throat> but verse 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, and whose trust the Lord is. It shall be as a tree planted by the waters, it spreads out its roots by the river, it shall not fear when heat cometh but its leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Well, we're coming to a great drought, folks. Everything that men trust in is going to dry up, but those that trust in the Lord are going to be like the, the tree planted by the rivers of water. They'll have their strength that they need to continue on in the wilderness that's coming. But Isaiah 53 says, To whom hath, who hath believed our message? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Uh, faith in the, the message is what causes us to cease from our own strength and put our trust in His. It reminds you a lot of um, Hebrews chapter 4 and uh, verse 3, which says, for we who have believed do enter into that rest, even as he has said, As I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. We know that the works were finished from the foundation of the world. God's power has been made manifest to us. Jesus Christ accomplished everything that we want to accomplish. He already accomplished it by his strength and by his might, which the rest of Isaiah 53 tells you. He basically already provided all these things. We're just entering into his works through faith. We cease from our works, which verse 10 says, For he that enters into his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. We rest from our own works, our own might, our own strength of the arm of the flesh. And what does he say? We who have believed do enter. As a matter of fact, it says in the numerics there, in the numeric pattern says, are entering. 
we who have believed are entering into that rest. So, who hath believed our message? That is, the one to whom the arm of the Lord is revealed. His strength is revealed to the people who are ceasing from their own self-efforts, their own self-works. Matter of fact, this chapter is very, very plain. You know, Jesus came not as somebody that anybody in the flesh would trust in. He was uh, apparently weak, you know, uh, in their sight. He was, uh, verse 3, rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Or actually, the word is sicknesses. And as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Well, you know, the people who come into his image are going to be the same way, folks. They're going to be rejected of the world, despised, looked upon with little esteem, not as someone who who they would think had great power. You, you take um, Samson, you know, People, all the story characters in the storybooks and the cartoons, they picture Samson as this big muscle-bound fellow, you know. But um, when he told Delilah his secret, finally, that if his hair was cut, he would be like any other man, that didn't seem to say that he had any personal strength of his own. You know, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about submission to the Lord, the hair, the long hair being submission to our Lord. Well, when he lost his long hair, he lost his submission to God. And when he lost his submission to God, he lost his strength. It was supernatural strength that he had. It was not natural strength because he became like any other man, not like a muscle-bound person at all, like any other man. They wanted to know the secret of his strength, the secret of his strength. Why would it be a secret if he had muscles? <laughs> No, it was a secret. See, how does this guy do this, you know? All right. Well, Jesus didn't appear to be a muscle-bound person, you know. He, uh, he was rejected by men, and um, God, God uh, uses um, the weak things of the world to confound the wisdom of the wise, right? He, he joys in doing that. But as you read on, you find out, that our, the secret of the arm of the Lord is, is discovering that the Lord already accomplished all this. You know, surely he hath borne our sicknesses. Coli. It's the word sicknesses, not griefs. Don't know. They just didn't believe in divine healing. That's why they put that there, because they translated his sickness everywhere else. So, surely he hath borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Makab, pains, is translated in other places. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So God put all of our sin upon Jesus. He healed us through Jesus. As 1 Peter 2.24, looking back at the cross, says that by his stripes we were healed. So God accomplished all this in him in order to make us weak. Since all this was already done, we should know that no strength of the flesh will have anything to do with doing the work of God. The Lord's already done this. He's already accomplished it. And... Uh, to those who understand that, the arm of the Lord can be revealed. They can have the strength of God. When they find out it's not their strength, it's not their efforts, it's not their own self-will, that they go about to do the work of God. It's not, in, it's not in the doctors. It's not in the psychiatrists that your sin problem is going to be solved. It's not in the doctors that your sickness problem is going to be solved. With the strength of the Lord, sure, with the strength of man but not with the strength of the Lord. To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? The people who, who see that all this was accomplished by the strength of the Lord, and we're just entering into it through faith. We enter into the rest, which is resting from our own works 
by understanding that the Lord's works have already accomplished our healing, our deliverance, our uh, provision, our deliverance from sin. He made you free from sin. A revelation that all of God's people need of the true gospel. He made you free from sin. He already accomplished this. It's not your efforts that are going to do this. It is your faith that are going to bring His power on the scene. The arm of the Lord being revealed. Go down to verse 10. It says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath made him sick, literally. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Well, when that happened, you know what happened, right? The Bible says a little bit further down, He poured out his soul unto death. Verse 12. When they made his soul an offering for sin, he died. Then it says, he shall see his seed. And of course, that was his children. He, except he died, he wasn't going to bring forth any fruit. He would stand alone, like he said. But if he died, he would bring forth much fruit. So when he died, he saw his seed. He shall prolong his days. Well, of course, Jesus died. He went into eternity. There are no days in eternity. But he saw his seed and he prolonged his days, which means, of course, that he prolonged his days living in his seed. The whole point of Jesus going away was so that he could come back and be manifested in his people. Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? So he prolonged his, he saw his seed, and in them he prolonged his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Well, now, if Jesus is the arm of the Lord, who's the hand? That is the people who are connected to the arm, the people who are uh, being used by the strength of the Lord because the revelation of the arm of the Lord is revealed to them, the revelation that they are not um, being used, uh, their, their flesh cannot bring forth the work of God. Their self-efforts cannot bring forth the work of God. It's all man's works if it is. But to be the hand of the Lord is to be an extension of His arm, to be an extension of Jesus Christ, right? And He shall see the travail of His soul, and He shall be satisfied. By the knowledge of Himself shall my righteous servant justify or make righteous many, and He shall bear their iniquities. So, the arm of the Lord is being manifested where? In Zion. And in Zion are those people who learn to let God's power be their power. They don't trust in themselves. It's not salvation by works. Spirit, soul, body, or circumstances is not salvation by works to these people. And another thing I want to point out to you that we, had, we noticed that this Zion is not physical Zion. No way it can be compared to physical Zion. But um, in Isaiah chapter 60, it says about Zion, verse 21, Thy people also shall all be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting the work of my hands that I may be glorified. Well, God's people in Zion are going to glorify Him and they're all going to be righteous. Do you understand that in this Zion there won't be any unclean, uncircumcised people. They're going to all be righteous. The only way you can come to spiritual Zion is to be righteous. Okay. I want to talk some more about this, this rest that comes to Zion. We saw that when the Lord comes to Zion, all of His leadership is going to see eye to eye. That's a major miracle. You know why? Because the Lord Himself has instructed His leadership of Zion. They're, in fact, of fact, they're going to be the ones to face the Lord as the first fruits. They're going to be instructed of the Lord first hand. That's why they're all seeing eye to eye. Jesus said that they will be one flock and one shepherd. Well, why are these going to, why are the leaders of Zion going to be so many people? It's because they're being used by the 
one shepherd. They've been instructed and taught by the one shepherd. And he is the one that is teaching through them. He is the one that's saving through them. He is the one that's doing the works. We're just called to cooperate with God so that he can use us as a vessel. It's not God training us how to do his work so we can go out and do it. It's God training us how to be in cooperation with him so that he can do it through us. It is the arm of the Lord. Not your arm. It's not my arm. It's the arm of the Lord. He wants to do the work through us. We are just to stay connected like the hand on the arm, right? So, let's look in Isaiah 59 and verse 16. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it upheld him. You recognize this, of course, when the Lord sent Jesus, right? But it didn't stop there because he's coming again, right? And he will put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing. Whoa, wait a minute now. In Isaiah 61, he left off before he got to the vengeance part. Jesus did. He stopped in verse 2. I'll read it to you. Isaiah 61. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. He left that part out. So why is he putting it in over here? Because now he's talking about the end time. Aha. Put on garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a mantle. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, and the islands he will repay recompense. Folks, the coastlands, think about the coastlands of America, you that live here with me, they're going to be ravaged, the coastlands of America. One thing after another, folks, hurricanes, comets hitting in the water, and Sending tsunamis, earthquakes on the West Coast. The coastlands are going to be judged. You know, a lot of the people live in the coastlands. Verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the West. Yes, in the West. And His glory from the rising of the sun. For He will come as a rushing stream. Now we just noticed in two of the verses that the Lord's going to return to Zion. He's going to return to dwell in the midst of His people. He will come as a rushing stream, which the breath of the Lord driveth. Now, I know that there are some other translations that totally pervert this. I'm just going to tell you that right off. They just totally pervert it. But this is the truth. The Lord is coming to Zion, just like he said in Malachi chapter 3. I believe it's verse 3. In fact, I better pop, pop over there real quick like and uh, just read that to you. And he, let's see, I better back up a little bit here. Uh, verse 1 Behold, I send my messenger He shall prepare the way before me And the Lord whom you seek Will suddenly come to his temple And the messenger of the covenant Whom you desire Behold, he cometh, saith the Lord of hosts and Who can abide the day of his coming And who can stand when he appeareth For he is like a refiner's fire Like a fuller's soap He will sit and ref as a refiner and as a purifier of silver, he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them as gold and silver. And uh, they shall offer unto the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant. So, listen, the Lord came to his temple. The Bible says in Hebrews that thou hast prepared for me a body. Which one do you think he was talking about? Well, the Lord prepared for the Son of God a body. And now he is preparing once again for the Son of God a corporate body in our time. Jesus, as you know, went away in order to come back in a corporate body. But uh, the false prophets destroyed the true gospel in people so they wouldn't understand the purpose of God. And now that God's people are returning to Zion and the understanding of the true gospel... They are going to be um, entering into this agreement with God and be used of God as the hand. And the Lord's going to be moving through them. So back over to uh, Isaiah 59. He will come unto us as a rushing stream which the breath or spirit of the Lord driveth. 
the Lord is coming into his first fruits. He's going to be manifested in his people. Now, that doesn't mean he's not coming in the sky, so don't, don't get me wrong here. We know he's coming that way, too. But the Bible does tell us two ways he's coming, an epiphany and a parousia. So, verse 20. You can go back and study that when you have time. Verse 20. And a Redeemer will come to Zion. That is where the Lord's going to live, folks. He's coming in His people. He's going to dwell in spiritual New Testament Zion. Unto who? Them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Those who have turned away from their sins. That's who He's coming to live in. Those who have turned away from walking in the flesh and uh, trusting in themselves and um, living in Babylon. You couldn't live in Babylon and Zion at the same time. And um, in these days, God is bringing out a group of people who are tired of bondage of Babylon and they're headed to Zion, folks. They want to live in the presence of God. They want God to be in their midst. They want Jesus to live in them. And they're going to accept that gift by faith. The Redeemer will come to Zion unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them. Who is that? Them. Zion. Them. It's people. Zion is people. With them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, says the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So the people in Zion speak the word of the Lord. They don't speak the word of man. Kind of like Jesus came on the scene to speak the unleavened bread, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Zealots and the people like that, they all spoke their own words, didn't they? So these are people that have ceased from their own works their own self-efforts, and they're just speaking the word of the Lord. They're trusting in the arm of God. And it says, Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord will rise upon thee. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. The nations shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Wow. Okay. Well, there is this same little key is seen in chapter 58. And guess what? Again, it's talking about ceasing from our works, entering into the rest. The people in Zion will be people who live in the rest. It will not be their works. It will not be the arm of the flesh. It will be the arm of the Lord moving through these people. Isaiah 58, I'm going to read, um, I think I'll start in verse 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke? He's talking about a spiritual fast here. I'm sure most of you have read it. He's talking about a ceasing from feeding the flesh. Do you understand that when you walk in the flesh, you're feeding the flesh? When you depend upon the flesh, you're feeding the flesh. And whatever you do in the flesh, you're enabling it to live. You're not fasting. You're not starving it. You know, you're letting it live, right? So he's talking about a spiritual fast here. Watch. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou... Uh, bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, and when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou uh, hide not thyself from thine own flesh. In other words, denial. See, many people, uh, they live in sin, but they deny it. They are not facing their flesh. They are not um, admitting their sin. You know, and, and, of course, after you admit your sin, you have to admit and confess the Savior and the salvation. But first, you have to confess and renounce the sin, right? Um, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy healing shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord 
Lord shall be thy rearward. Thou shalt call, and the Lord will answer. Thou shalt cry, and he will say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking wickedly, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in darkness. There's the phrase right there, the same one we just saw in Isaiah 60 and 1, speaking about Zion. Now we're talking about them ceasing from their works and not permitting their flesh to live and uh, living a spiritual fast. There, there shall thy light rise in darkness, and thine obscurity shall be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in dry places, and make strong thy bones. Thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. You remember how Jesus raised up disciples that that went out to restore in the former reign everything that had been taken from God's people. They were building the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. The foundations have been destroyed by many foxes, many false prophets among God's people, many false leaders. The foundations that enable us to be connected to the arm of the Lord have been destroyed. The real true gospel has been destroyed among these people. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. In other words, they're going to restore the holes in the wall through which the enemy comes, the attacks come. The restorer of paths to dwell in. For if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight. Now what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is ceasing from your own works, and entering into rest through faith. He that hath believed doth enter in to that rest. You see, it doesn't matter what day you keep, Saturday or Sunday, folks. If you're not walking as a believer in the promises of God, you are not in God's New Testament spiritual Sabbath. And we have to cease from our own works all the time, every day. Not just one day a week. That's just a type and a shadow, not the fulfillment of the Sabbath. We're talking about the fulfillment of the Sabbath. And we're talking about who is going to be living it. It's going to be Zion. They're going to be living it. They're going to be ceasing from their own self-efforts. Ceasing from their own trusting in the arm of the flesh to bring about the works of God, as many religions do. They uh, do the work of God in the flesh by man's self-efforts instead of by faith entering into the rest so that they see the work of God coming through them, the arm of the Lord. So, do you turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy of the Lord honorable and shalt honor it not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. See, we're not here to please ourselves anymore, folks. We are bondservants of the Lord Jesus Christ. It should be our pleasure to serve Him. And we can't serve Him with the arm of the flesh. He doesn't accept salvation by works, man's works. It's God's works that were accomplished through the arm of the Lord that we need to empower us. And that only comes by faith. But when you believe, when you believe the report, the arm of the Lord is revealed unto you. God's power is revealed unto you when you believe the report. What's the report? That the Lord already accomplished all of this. He already provided everything you need. My God shall supply your every need according to His riches and glory. A good report in a nutshell is right there. Nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou... You see, did you notice that the people of Zion would be speaking the Lord's words? Okay. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will make thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. 
and I will feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Well, we want the heritage of Jacob and not Esau, don't we? You know what the heritage of Esau is? Well, if you go to Isaiah 63, you see what the heritage of, of Edom is. And it is uh, when the Lord treads out the wine press in uh, Bozrah, which was the capital of Edom, but it also means the sheepfold. And Edom, of course, was Esau's seed. It's, it represents those who, who thought they had the heritage of Isaac, but no, it was Jacob who had the heritage. And so many of what we call Christians, their heritage is basically selling their birthright. And that's what they do. They spend their time selling their birthright. Just like it says of Esau in Hebrews, for one mess of meat, he sold his birthright. For following after the flesh, he sold his birthright. Well, the Lord's garments were dyed red, coming from Bozrah in chapter 63. He said, verse 3, I've trodden the wine press alone. And he called it the day of vengeance in verse 4. You see, the people who don't live the life, the people who trust in the arm of the flesh and walk in the flesh and don't live the life, they're going into the great and terrible day of the Lord. They're not going to escape. Zion is going to totally escape that. Let me read something else to you. But I'd rather talk about the rest here than those people. In um, chapter 56, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is near to come. There he says it again. And my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that holdeth it fast, and keepeth the Sabbath from profaning it. All of those who, by their own self-efforts and by their false doctrines that today God does it this way, today God does it that way, they put their trust in their own self-efforts to save themselves when the Lord freely gave us all things. You can't do anything, you can't add anything to the work of God for healing, for deliverance, for deliverance from sin. You can't do anything, you can't add anything to it. You just have to cease from your works. You have to accept it as a free gift. That's where you get to see the power of God. When you come to the place that you're no longer leaning on the arm of the flesh and under the curse, Jeremiah 17, 5 says, how do we come out from under the curse? We have to enter into the rest. We have to cease from our works. We have to put our faith in the power that God used, which was Jesus Christ, to accomplish all this for us in the beginning of the New Testament that keepeth the Sabbath from profaning it, that keepeth his hand from doing any evil. You understand, folks, we've now entered into the seventh day, and judgment is coming upon the world. Now, why? Because we've entered into the seventh day, and man refuses to cease from his works. That's why judgment is coming now. Neither let the foreigner that hath joined himself to the Lord uh, speak, saying, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord, If the eunuch that keep my Sabbaths, that is, people that don't sow their own seed, right? And they work for their Lord. They're faithful. But they don't sow their own seed, because they're eunuchs. Thus saith the Lord, Of the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, they cease from their own works. Right? and choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant. Unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a memorial, or actually a hand. That's the word hand there. And a name better than of sons and of daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. They will be a hand. They will be a hand for the Lord to use because they cease from their own works. They're not connected to the arm of the flesh. They're connected to the arm of the Lord. God bless you, folks. For more 
information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.